in the middle of the uh, k-means uh, clustering algorithm, um, yes, we already looked into the algorithm. Let's look. Yeah, let's look into this uh, source code uh, patch. Um, so k means k means means <laughs> that there are k means. Um, so the goal is to partition our data samples into k different clusters. Yeah? And uh, so you have to, as a user, provide this number k. So if I want to have two clusters, then k is equal to two. Um, I mean, this is at the same time an advantage and a disadvantage. It's an advantage if you know I want to have uh, 15 clusters, then you set k equal 15. Yeah? But if you have no idea about the number of clusters, then this of course is a disadvantage, yeah, because you have no idea about k. Um, okay, so now you see k is one of the parameters, and uh, these are, are our n data points. And now we initialize the, the centers or the means of our k clusters. Huh? Um, I mean, this can be done manually if you have an idea about where the clusters may be located, or you could just uh, randomly select uh, some initial means. Huh? Um, and then we go into this uh, loop uh, consisting of two parts. Part first is we classify all our data points to their nearest um, mean, uh, to their nearest center. Um, once we have done this, we recalculate the, the means again and we repeat this whole loop until these, um, these means get stable. That means until they no longer change. Yeah? And finally, we return these means. Okay, we, we looked at this algorithm in, uh, yeah, in this example. So we have this set of data points. Initially, they all have the same color, so they would all be, let's say, black. Um, and now, these are our initial, may, may be randomly chosen centers. Yeah? And now we assign each data point to its closest center. Yeah? So what we could do is to draw um, this separating line, uh, which is orthogonal to the... Um, the connecting line between the two centers. Um, and now you see um, this is class 1 and this is class 2. And what you also see now is that this center for this cluster number 2 is no longer really a center. Huh? Um, so the next step is we recalculate the mean for the black cluster which is here and for the gray cluster which is here. And now we do this maximization step which means, um, actually here it's a minimization, we look for, um, yeah, so we reassign all data points to the closest center. And for example, these two, they are critical because they are now closer to this center. Um, and so now we get this separating line. And we will do a recalculation of the means now. Look, this mean goes a little bit towards this direction. And this one, is there any change here? Maybe a little bit to the left. And now it's, it's finished, after four iterations. 
and the result doesn't look too bad. I mean, it's, it's, it's not easy with these data because they are not really clearly clustered. So there are, there are a couple of ways uh, to cluster these data. Maybe that would, might be a separ an interesting separation too. Huh? Um, yes, and, and that's very important. The result of k-means depends on our initial centers. And uh, I mean, we might try this algorithm um, by starting here and maybe here. And then maybe we might get such a separation. If the situation is, if we have a clear separation of two clusters, then uh, no matter how you start with your initial centers, you will get a good separation. But if it's not so clear as it is here, then you may get different uh, results depending on the initial uh, centers. Okay, yeah, we looked at the algorithm. Um, yeah, let's talk a little bit about um, computational complexity. Um, yeah, the complexity is, so the, the, the time um, is, uh, an upper bound for the time is n times d times k times t. N is the number of points, D is the dimensionality of the feature space. Here in this example, D was two, two-dimensional space. Uh, T is the number of iteration steps. In our example, it was four. And I mean, of course, we don't know how big the number of iterations is, but in practice, typically, it's not too big. It's, uh, here it was four. I did it. I will show you a, a variant of this algorithm where we also have a small number of iterations. So this typically is not too large. Huh? Um, and k is the number of clusters. So yeah, maybe we should try to understand this because I mean this is not really difficult. Huh? Um, where does the n come from? So the time is linear in the number of data points. I mean, the t comes from, of course, the number of uh, iterations we do here. Huh? That's the factor t. So now where does n come from? I mean, you, you already see it here. Classify all data points to their nearest mean. So we, we really have to look at all the data points. That gives us a factor of n. Now, um, where does the, um, the k come from? Yeah, here you see, recalculate all the means. So we have to calculate k means. Yeah? And for each of the means, um, we may have n up to n data points, yes. So we, here we get a k times n. And where does the d come from, the dimensionality of the data? Why is the time linear in the dimensionality. So we have to multiply the whole time by d. We have to check the distance for all dimensions. Yes. It's, it's about uh, computing the distance. Yeah? Um, we have to check. No, we have to compute. One distance, uh, which 
Äh, also wir haben halt eine Distanz, die alle Dimensionen berücksichtigt. Yes, yes. Uh, so the, dim the, the distance considers all the dimensions and maybe we should look at the formulas for computing the distances. Look here for example, the Euclidean distance. And here we have, um, yeah, let's see, yeah, so this n here is actually the, the dimension. So this n here has to be replaced by d, d that's the dimensionality, and you see, the, so the, the, the number of elements in this sum is uh, equal to the dimension, and so we have, a, for computing the distance between two points, uh, the time goes linear in D. No? Okay. And that's how, why we get uh, this, comp this computational complexity. Which is not too bad. Uh, what's good is that we have a linear scaling with the number of data points. Okay, yeah, and now uh, I have to mention the EM algorithm. The EM algorithm, it's a shorthand for expectation maximization algorithm. This is a well-known algorithm in the areas of probabilistic reasoning and machine learning, especially in machine learning. Um, and Yes, I mentioned it at this, at this point. There are, there are many applications of the EM algorithm. I mention it here because uh, our k-means is a very simple special case of the EM algorithm. Why? Um, because the two, the two statements in this loop they are maximization and expectation steps. Huh? Here, classify all the data points to their nearest uh, center. Huh? Um, so we, let's say what we do here is we maximize the similarity between all the data points and their center. Huh? or we minimize the distance um, between the data points and their centers. Huh? Um, and this here is the expectation step. Because now we define our new classes. Um, so each class is a set of points and for this set of points we uh, estimate the expected value, which is the, the arithmetic mean. Yeah? So, maximization step and expectation step. Um, yes, okay, and maybe, maybe you should correct what's written in the book, because, I mean, it's not really uh, false, but it's, it's not very well um, presented this algorithm. So I, I corrected this and I like, well, I like this uh, better. What, what, what do you have here? Um, yeah, and what, what is the difference or what's more general? We are now not, are not only talking about hard classes. What we want to do in the EM algorithm is the following. So suppose we have our data points. Um, and suppose we want to have uh, two clusters now. Now we, um, we try to find a probability distribution um, over our data points and if we have k equal 2, we want to have two 
uh, distributions. And for the moment, suppose uh, we are just looking for Gaussian distributions. And we may have one distribution for, for one cluster and another distribution uh, for the other clusters. And um, yeah, maybe I should even continue drawing it like that because, I mean, of course there is an overlap. Uh, such, a, such a normal distribution has an infinite width. And now such a normal distribution gives me the probability for uh, some point in this space um, to belong um, to this red class or to the yellow class. And of course, once I am finished and once I have found such probability distributions, there will be a separating line. Huh? And this separating line goes through this point and this point and such a point. So it may be, it may even be a straight line, but it doesn't need to. So suppose it may be something like that. Huh? Um, so why does it, why does this line, um, hit the, this intersection of the yellow and the, the red line. I mean, this is only true if this is a contour line for uh, p equal, let's say, 0 0.02. And this is also p equal 0 0.02. If I am to uh, to the left of this point, so uh, then uh, the, the the value of the yellow distribution is higher than that of the red distribution. In the, and if I'm to the right, this value is higher. Yeah? And we assign the points um, to the class with higher probability. That's the idea. Yeah? Okay, so now, uh, yeah, let's look at the algorithm. Oh no, maybe, maybe I, I mean, I, I wrote a little Octave program over the weekend. This was actually my, I think my second Octave program uh, that I wrote. Um, I really want to get experience, more experience in Octave. Uh, I mean, the, the, the major reason why I did it in Octave was I wanted to do it in Mathematica because I'm quite experienced in Mathematica. And at the weekend, I don't have Mathematica at home, so I, I always call it here at the FH via SSH. And then it turned out it doesn't, it doesn't run in the, in the Linux lab. Huh? Uh, because, and, and that really annoys me, um, we have a Mathematica license, and this license goes for many years. But every year in December, right before Christmas, we always have to renew this license ID. So somebody, which is Mr. Pelk, he forgot it this year again, as every year. Um, <laughs> so he didn't renew this license number, and then finally I can't use Mathematica, and it's always uh, on Sunday. Yeah. Uh, so I was really annoyed, and then I decided to go into Octave, which cost me a lot of work because I don't know this language, and, uh, but finally at half past one I was finished with the program. Uh, yeah, yeah, unfortunately, not in the afternoon, but in the night. Uh, okay, um, but it, yeah, finally it works. Um, so I wrote this uh, program, and um, yeah, what I used as data points, uh, and, and uh, it's, it, so yet it only works in a one dimensional. Uh, variant. I mean, it wouldn't be difficult for more dimensions, but it was late enough at uh, half past one. I used these data points, but I projected them to the x-axis. Huh? 
So I just use the X component of these data points. And yeah, you will, you will now see uh, how these data points look like. And um, yeah, so let's start with, uh, um, so we call this program um, with, um, so this is the, the, uh, the data vector, data one dimensional. Um, and, oh, I mean, we could, I can show you the data. Data one dimensional, it's just this vector. Huh? 30 points. Okay. And now we start our clustering, uh, EM clustering algorithm with these data. And now we have to give initial values for the means and for the standard deviation. I mean, such a, such a, a one dimensional uh, normal distribution um, is parameterized by the mean and the standard deviation. Okay, uh, this is, um, and I want to have two clusters. So for two clusters, I have to give two means, uh, and we start with point 0.1 and point 0.9 as the initial means, and with point 0.1 for the two sigmas. Okay. And now that's what we get. I mean, our data points, they are one dimensional. Um, and we start uh, with initial, what was the initial uh, muse? Point 0.9 and uh, point 0.1 and point 0.9, yeah. So one mean is here and the other mean is here. And the sigma is point 0.12. Huh? So that's what we get as a distribution, and this is what we get as the second distribution. Yeah? Um, so there, there, uh, this is just the normal, the two initial normal distributions. Nothing happened yet, but now something happens. Now we assign all our data points to the distribution which gives the higher probability and as you can see immediately for all these points here I mean for these you really see it and uh, I mean we can't see it here but actually uh, these are the points where the left uh, normal distribution gives a higher probability and these are the points with a higher probability for the right distribution. Uh, um, and now, I mean, this was one iteration. No, it's, it's, this is the, the first part, the maximization step for iteration number one. Now comes the expectation step for iteration number one, which means now we take these red points and compute the mean. And of course, as you can see, the mean would be somewhere here, and here maybe it's somewhere here. So this, this uh, curve will be shifted to the right. Now let's go into the next iteration. Yeah, and that's what we get. So you see the, the maximum goes to the right and it gets wider. And for this one, the maximum goes to the left and it gets wider. Yeah? Um, yes, and we did not yet, as you can see, we did not yet assign the data points to uh, the corresponding distribution. So this, um, so we have to continue. Okay, so now, yeah, and now it's finished. You see the program finished um, after three iterations of our algorithm. Or was it two iterations? Yes, we, we saw the initial picture. 
which was kind of iteration zero, and then two iterations. And now you see the class boundary is here. It's exactly here where, where we have the crossing of the two uh, probability density functions. And I mean, now we can uh, we can do it with, um, for example, three clusters. Where do we have one? Yeah, let's start with this. So now the cluster centers are 0 0.01, 0 0.5, and 0.9, and the sigmas are one for each. So we have a pretty wide uh, probability density function. Okay, that's what we get initially. These are the three probability density functions drawn in this interval. And already you can see that we get some yeah, quite reasonable clustering. Look, the green points, they come from, I mean, the, they are the points in the area where the green curve has the maximum. Here the red curve is maximum, so they see these are, are the red ones and the blue ones. And now if we continue, after one iteration, it looks like that, which is uh, much better. You see the, the, the sigmas are adjusted much better now. And, oh, and we are, we, are, we are finished already. So this is already stable now. Yeah. I mean, what I did here as a as a stopping criteria for the algorithm, I just compared the old vector of the, of the mu's, of the means, with the new vector. And if this difference is less than um, 10 to the minus 6, then I stop. So I didn't look at the sigmas. Maybe I should have done this too. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, maybe try to remember this is the left cluster, this is the middle cluster, and this is the right one. I mean, intuitively, we would have put this point to the middle uh, cluster and not to the left cluster. So this is kind of not really optimal. No? Um, but we can... We can try to start with another initialization. Yes, let's try this one. Again, three clusters. But what I used now was extremely sm small sigmas. Huh? Um, and then picture looks like this. Huh? And so the initial clusters are now kind of what we would expect. This one, this one, and this one. Um, and if we now continue, we get this, and we are finished. So you see now, we get a better result, and maybe it's a better idea to start with uh, small sigmas rather than with very large sigmas. But again, you see the result depends on the initialization of sigma and mu. Okay, any questions about this? Yeah? Macht die Größe von Sigma hier wirklich was aus, wenn man überall das gleiche Sigma verwendet? Sie meinen für alle drei Cluster das gleiche Sigma? Ich habe für alle drei das gleiche Sigma verwendet. Ja. Das heißt, waren die da nicht sowieso dem gleichen Zugang, egal welches Sigma man verwendet? Ich meine, hier ist bei dem zweiten Beispiel war jetzt auch das mittlere Cluster der Startwert anders. Da war es nicht ja. Oh, so you mean, 
uh, if we start with the same mean values, then it doesn't matter what sigmas we have. And this special case where all sigmas are the same, I would expect that. It may be true, but I'm not sure. I, I can't prove this. Huh? It may be true. But I, th I think this does not hold in general, especially if we have many clusters in, mu in, multi uh, in multiple dimensions. Yeah, but in this Maybe in one dimension, um, no, even in one dimension, I guess it's not true. Could you try it for this case with the same starting method? Oh, yes, of course. So what would you like now? Oh, 0.5 in the middle, okay. Ah, yeah, okay. So we, it looks like we get the same result as before with the higher sigma. Yes. So in my, why don't we uh, use this one with sigma equal 1? Hmm. Now what? Uh, ah, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. So at least in this example, you're right, yeah. Okay, other questions? So now let's go back to the slides. Um, yeah. And um, yeah, let's look into uh, again this uh, pseudocode of the algorithm. So in the maximization step for each data point, um, the probability, this is the conditional probability for um, uh, for having cluster number j given data point xi. So it's a probability that uh, data point number i belongs to cluster number j. Yeah? Um, and we will compute this probability for all the data points. And this is not difficult because we know the means and the sigmas. Yeah? And so we, we just use the formula for the normal distribution with given sigma and given uh, mu. And then we get these probability values. Yeah? And now we use these probability values and assign each data point to the class with maximum probability. So uh, let's fix a data point, uh, number i. Let's say maybe i is equal to uh, 15. So we take data point number 15 and now we compute for x15 all the conditional probabilities for all j. So if we look for three clusters, then we get three different probabilities. And now we select the class with the highest probability value. Huh? And that's what we assign to data point number 15. That's what happens here. Using these conditional probabilities, we assign to each data, po each data point to the class with maximum probability. That's the maximization step. And here you see why it's called maximization. Because we maximize the class probability. Uh, and now we do the expectation step, which is recomputing the parameters mu and sigma for all the classes. Yeah. That's it. 
I mean, this is a really simple algorithm um, for finding a probability distribution. Yeah? Um, there are many, many um, procedures for finding probability distributions in machine learning, but many algorithms are really uh, hard uh, and especially mathematically very difficult and computationally very expensive. Um, and in such cases, very often, people use the EM algorithm. And the EM algorithm is kind of a, like a fixed point iteration. So we start with some random guess for the probability distribution, or maybe a non-random guess, maybe a heuristic guess for the distributions. Here we need um, k distributions. Uh, we start with the heuristic guess. Then we assign all the data points to the distributions uh, to, uh, which give the maximum probability and then we recompute the distributions. That's what happens all the time. No? It is a heuristic algorithm. You, you have seen there is no guarantee that you get an optimal solution. The solution, solution even depends on the initial conditions, on the initialization for our distributions, but uh, it typically works quite well. Yeah, and we get a softer clustering as we had it before. Yeah? I mean, before we, we really had hard class boundaries. Yeah. Yeah, as another example, the EM algorithm is also used to learn Bayesian networks. And uh, especially for the case, we didn't talk about this case. Up to now, um, in the Bayesian network chapter, we only talked about discrete variables. Huh? But now, if we want to do the same thing with continuous variables, then we are talking about probability distributions. And now, uh, so up to now, we had to fill up our conditional probability tables, our CPTs. Yeah? And that's what we can do by just counting frequencies. But as soon as we want to determine distributions, maybe Gaussian distributions, then we have to find these distributions based on our data and for this one can also use a refined variant of the EM algorithm and for many other applications. I mean, now you have seen the EM algorithm on a, on a simple example which was clustering and this also, this is called the EM clustering algorithm. Okay, yeah. Now we look at a different clustering algorithm. Uh, yeah, nowadays there are really many uh, clustering algorithms uh, available, and these are just two examples out of almost infinitely many. Um, and I mean, this hierarchical clustering algorithm goes a little bit into the direction of overcoming the problem that we have with k-means. With k-means, we have to know how many clusters we want. Yeah? Um, and here, we don't have to, uh, to uh, give a fixed cluster number, yeah? even though you will see what happens. Yeah. Um, yeah, let's, let's start with the example. Yeah. This is the same example data. Here we have our points. And now what happens is, it's a really simple algorithm. What we do is, we cluster together in the first step just pairs of points. So um, what we do is, we take the two points which are closest together. I guess it, uh, it was these two points. Yeah? Um, and then we, we take the next two points, which is these two, and then maybe these two, and these two. Um, and um, 
up to a, a certain uh, threshold, we, we put all, so we, we connect points. And uh, I mean, uh, up to a certain threshold, this is a cluster, and this is a cluster, and this is one, and this is a cluster. Yeah. And then, I mean, we continue, we continue increasing this uh, threshold, and so we get, we get uh, bigger and bigger clusters. And what's interesting, you see, this is now one cluster. Uh, and this is a cluster, and this is a cluster. And if we, uh, we, we continue until finally, we just have one cluster. Uh. And now, I mean, you can stop this algorithm at some point where you like it. If, if you have an implementation of the algorithm which does it graphically, uh, I mean, then you can just observe and hit the stop key, and then you say, maybe you would like this picture, and then you stop here. Huh? Or maybe here, this looks nice too. And so we might say that the number of clusters is determined semi-automatically. Huh? At least you don't have to give the number of clusters. If you want to have it fully automatically, you have to specify a threshold. Uh, a threshold for the, um, for the maximum distance of points within one cluster. I mean, the maximum distance was, I would say, uh, about this. Or this. So if this would be your threshold, then you would get this, this set of clusters. Huh? So instead of uh, specifying the number of clusters, you can specify such a threshold for the maximum distance of pairs of points within one cluster. Yeah, and that's what we call hierarchical clustering. Why hierarchical? Because if you start here, uh, it's kind of a bottom-up procedure. Um, at the beginning, the number of clusters is equal to the number of points. So you can get, as m at most, n clusters. Huh? And then you decrease the number of clusters until, finally, we have one cluster. Okay, so but now let's look at the, the code. Yeah, hierarchical clustering. So the input is only our data points, and we initialize our clusters as just single data points. Every single data point is a cluster initially. Um, and now we go into this loop, find two clusters, i and j, with the smallest distance. And then combine them. Huh? And then we repeat this loop until some termination condition is reached. I mean, if there is no termination condition, it will run until we have one cluster. Huh? or this condition may be some maximum distance of points within one cluster. Well, that's it. It's quite simple, too. Um, yeah. And you can, you can view this algorithm as, um, look, we start here on the bottom level with all data points, I mean, this is a one-dimensional illustration again. Uh, suppose we have one-dimensional data points, and then um, yeah, the, the, in the first step, the two closest points will be joined. And then we are at the next level. Uh, and then um, in the next step, here we join thi this cluster with one data point. 
And maybe here you see um, yeah, a question arises and the question is what is the distance between a cluster and a point? Let's look at our example. Yeah, suppose we have this cluster and this point. What is the distance between this cluster and the point? Is it the distance, so the minimum distance between all points and this point, which would this one be this one? Or, I mean, is it the distance between the center of this cluster and the center of this cluster? Yeah, let's take two clusters. This cluster and this cluster. Here we have two points. So the center would be here and the center would be here. Is this the distance between two clusters? Or we could even say, no, the distance between two clusters is... Um, so we take the distances of all pairs of nodes be between cluster 1 and cluster 2. So this distance and this distance and this and this and so on. And then out of all these distances, we may take the minimum we may take the maximum, we may take the average. These are all different distance metrics for clusters. And depending on the distance metric for clusters, we will get a completely different clustering algorithm. What we have used here, I didn't tell you before, what I used here in this example was the minimum distance. Maybe you would have intuitively also taken the, the minimum distance. If you take the minimum distance, then what you get, you see it here, is kind of uh, snake-like clusters. Huh? If you use the maximum distance, oh, I don't have the picture here, sorry. Unfortunately, there is no picture. But if you use the, 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 uh, the farthest neighbor algorithm, you use the maximum distance between two clusters, then you get more compact clusters. No? Oh yes, what's also interesting, if you use these uh, this nearest neighbor distance metric. Then what you get here, this one cluster at the end um, is a spanning tree of our data points. Do you remember what is a spanning tree? Uh, um, sorry, a minimum spanning tree. I mean, there are many spanning trees but the minimum spanning trees. What is a minimum spanning tree in a graph? First, what is a spanning tree? Yes, yes. A tree that connects all points. Huh? And I mean, it, uh, it's undirected, and so a tree is not allowed to contain any circles. Huh? So the number of connections in this graph is minimal. Huh? So this would be not allowed, for example if we have these already. But what is a minimum spanning tree then? It's a spanning tree where the sum of the distances of these connecting lines is minimal. Yeah? And this algorithm finally gives us a minimum spanning tree which is 
I would say, quite obvious. So this is another minimum spanning tree algorithm. If you run it to the end. Okay, yes, let's look at this picture. And I mean, what you get if you start here bottom up until the top, here you get your minimum spanning tree finally. Okay, yes, and uh, we already talked about distance metrics. Um, this is a definition for the minimum uh, distance, which leads then to the so-called nearest neighbor algorithm. Huh? I mean, this is historic. It is called nearest neighbor algorithm, and you have to be really careful because we already know a nearest neighbor method. Huh? The nearest neighbor method for supervised learning, uh, you know it, but it is of course different from this nearest neighbor algorithm. So be careful. And the distance metric for the nearest neighbor algorithm for the distance between two clusters i and j is the minimum over all vectors in cluster A and all vectors in cluster J. And here we use um, the vector norm. Yeah? Um, which, I mean, of course, here we also can talk about, OK, what is the distance between two vectors? We can use the Euclidean norm. We can use the maximum norm, the Manhattan distance, whatever. Yeah? Okay, yeah. Okay, what did we need forget yet? Yeah. So I mean it it is obvious to use an adjacency matrix um, for all the data points because if we use this then we do not have to recompute the distances between data points. So that means when we start the algorithm, our data points are fixed. So now we compute the adjacency matrix, which contains the distances between all pairs of data points. And the number of pairs of points um, is n times n minus 1 over 2, which uh, grows quadratically with the number of points n. Uh, so the, the time for computing the adjacency matrix um, is proportional to n squared. Um, and then uh, during the clustering um, we just have to look up our distances in this matrix which may also have quadratic complexity but not more. Uh, um, and of course storage uh, requirements also incre increase quadratically with the number of points. And if the number of data points becomes very large, suppose we have a million uh, points, then I mean the square of a million is 10 to the 12, which is quite large. This is then a trillion. Uh -huh. uh, so you, you would need uh, kind of terabyte storage uh, to store the whole adjacency matrix. That might be then a problem. Um, the iteration is repeated n minus one times. Of course, one iteration is just adding one next point to our clusters. Um, yeah, and you see, so we have n minus 1 iterations times n squared in per iteration, which is a, an overall computation time of n uh, power 3. Okay, yeah, and uh, uh, a variant is the farthest neighbor algorithm where we just replace the minimum here by a maximum. Um, yeah. And a third alternative is 
uh, not minimum or maximum, we just use the clusters midpoint, so the, the mean, the center of the clusters. Yeah? yeah. Oh, yeah, and maybe here I should uh, refer to this nice book, um, Duda, Hart and Stork, uh, Pattern Classification. Um, this is a very nice book about yeah, machine learning and pattern classification. The first um, edition of this book, which appeared, I, I would say, around 1980, um, was called Pattern Classification and Scene Analysis by Duda and Hart, which is really a classical book. Um, okay, yes. And I mean, I'm not really familiar with the latest state of the art in clustering. And two days ago, um, a student asked me, he wants to do what I mentioned recently in the lecture, uh, when we started the clustering chapter, then I mentioned that if you uh, search for some uh, uh, text in Google, then you just get an un, um, unstructured, it, uh, assorted but unstructured list of hits, but uh, there is no clustering. And he wants to do such a clustering in some search engine. And now he asked me for a good clustering algorithm and especially he wanted to have an algorithm which automatically determines the number of clusters. Yeah. And I don't know what's the best algorithm now known in terms of uh, determining the number of clusters. The, the problem here is it is hard to define what you mean with best. Huh? If you look at our example, um, then if you ask here, if you look at this example and you ask, uh, and you would show people all the pictures. I mean, here you have n minus 1 pictures. Huh? Actually, you have n pictures. Huh? And you ask many people, then they wouldn't all agree and say this is the best clustering or this or that. Yeah? So you see, this is, it depends on what you want and your personal feeling and whatever, and on the application. So th this is a, a heuristic matter. Yeah? But, but uh, even though it's heuristic, um, one algorithm may be better in finding a number k and another algorithm would be worse. No? Um, yes. There, is, there, there are obvious ways how you could heuristically determine uh, the number of clusters k. Um, yeah, let's go back to this, to the k-means picture. We could run the algorithm here until it terminates with k equal 2. And then we run the same algorithm again with k equal 3. And then with k equal 4 and 5 and 6 and 7. Yeah? And now how could you, after running it many times, how could you now determine a kind of optimal k? We could, after running the algorithm, look here. Here we have two clusters and now we could compute the distance between these two clusters, which is this, if you take the, 
the distance of the closest point, pair of points. And this is the distance. Huh? Now if you increase the number of clusters, then we may increase the number of clusters until the minimum distance of the clusters decreases. I mean, we could easily get a third cluster, which is this one, and here the distance between these two clusters is even bigger, so this is, this is good to produce this new cluster. And, um, yeah, and also we would, of course, separate these two into two clusters, but when we come to a point, for example, where we would have to separate here, this wouldn't increase quality anymore. Huh? Because now the, uh, the minimum distance between two clusters would be much smaller. Huh? So we would, we would increase k until the minimum distance between two clusters starts decreasing again. Yeah. That, but that's a heuristic procedure. Huh? It is a heuristic procedure. Okay, any questions about clustering? Because now we can finish this section. Okay, yeah. Um, data mining in practice. Um, we, we talked about machine learning and I already said machine learning and data mining is kind of the same. The, 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 the main uh, difference is that in data mining uh, people typically have extremely large data sets and thus maybe difficult algorithms, especially complex algorithms, cannot be used because they would uh, take too much time. So w they try to use simple algorithms. Huh? Um, yeah. And now these people, they, they of course, they, uh, they are not so much interested in theory. They want to have uh, systems that are easy to use, that are easy to use for people who don't have much idea of AI and machine learning. Uh, so they need a convenient uh, graphical user interface, tools for data visualization. Um, they also need such practical tools. I mean, if a computer science does machine learning, it is no problem if the input data, which are in a file or in a database, they may be formatted however they are. You just write a little program and reformat it and then you can use it as an input for some algorithm. But if there is a person who cannot program, then uh, they are happy to have a software uh, which can deal with whatever format the data come. Maybe they are in Excel file or it's a database or it's just an ASCII file or comma separated, whatever. Huh? Um, yeah, and also uh, an issue is of course missing values. If there are missing values in the data, then you should, on the graphical user interface, be able to tell the system how it should deal with uh, missing values. And, yeah. Um, and there are nowadays many different data mining tools available. Here is just a small selection of, of uh, some out of them. So there is this rapid miner, maybe I should mention Clementine, because Clementine comes from the, the SPSS company and SPSS is the, uh, the best known statistics uh, software. This is a software that everybody uses who does applied statistics like psychologists and uh, physicians and so on. This is another uh, data mining tool and one which I really could recommend is the K9. Um, 
maybe because it's from Konstanz, which is not far from here. But I mean, Kainheim is not just here in, in uh, Oberschwaben or in Baden-Württemberg popular. It's, it's meanwhile one of the, the best known uh, data mining platforms. Um, and um, there are two reasons for this. Reason number one is it's really comfortable. Uh, and reason number two, which is, I guess, even more important, it's open source. Yeah? So it's, it's based on, uh, it's a Java implementation and it runs in the uh, Eclipse uh, environment. Um, yeah. And I, uh, I really want to ask you to work with Kname. Uh, it is installed in the Linux lab, so you can use it there. But I guess it's quite an old version. So maybe you'd rather download it uh, and run it on your own computer. Yeah, um, and I do have a, um, a screenshot here. Um, I don't, I don't uh, give you a demo because, I mean, this is just uh, application software and it's, it's not hard to use. No? Uh, so in this Eclipse framework, there is uh, one window which displays such a graph. Um, and this is such a data flow graph. You can, I mean, fr from this, from this uh, table here, you can select nodes. For example, um, here we have this VK folder. VK, I should also mention VK. VK is this open source machine learning library. Here, it's mentioned. It's also an open source Java machine learning library and it was developed by the authors uh, Witten and Frank. They, they are the authors of this well-known data mining book. Um, and they have this nice li library which, uh, yeah, it turns out to become a standard in supervised learning algorithms. Um, and of course it's a good idea that they just uh, build up on the VK library. They do have other algorithms too, but they use the whole VK library and inside the VK library there are tree algorithms, decision tree algorithms, and there is this J48, which is a re-implementation of the C4.5 algorithm. Okay, and yeah, look, so what I want, what I have to do, if I want to use this J48 algorithm, I just grab it with the mouse and put it into this uh, window, and then I get such a J48 node. And uh, then I take a file reader node because I have to read my data from some file. Huh? And this is then here. And then I connect the output of this node with the input of this node and the output of our uh, decision tree learner with a decision tree uh, predictor. Um, I mean, the decision tree learner produces a decision tree out of my training data. Now, if I want to apply the decision tree to classify new data, then I use the decision tree predictor. And this decision tree predictor, of course, also needs a connection to an input file uh, to read the test data. And then the scorer, the scorer, look here, here we have, uh, if you click onto the scorer, then you get such a result matrix. Um, here we have the appendicitis data. And uh, so this number is the number of correctly classified positive data, this is the correctly classified negative data, and these are the errors, false positive and false negative. So you see the score tells us uh, also the error rate here, you see the, the error rate is 23.5 percent. Yeah. It's a nice tool and you see it works without programming. Oh yeah, and here, in this window, 
you see the structure of our uh, J48 decision tree. It, so it starts with the leukocytes node and so on. Uh, and whenever there is this little blue symbol, that means there is a subtree. If, to, if you click onto it, then uh, a subtree unfolds. It's really a nice tool. But of course, it's questionable whether a computer scientist wants to use such a tool. Huh? I mean, I would recommend, so if, if the question for you is, whether to do more programming in order to understand the algorithms or to use uh, the canine, I'd rather do the programming because for us computer scientists, at least for me this is true, it really helps me in understanding an algorithm when I program it myself. Okay, yeah. Oh, there is another network with k -Nime. What did I do there? Yeah, there is a, the RProp multilayer perceptron, which is a neural network learner. Um, yeah, this is, this is just uh, training a neural network. It looks a little bit more complicated uh, due to a number of reasons. One of them is that neural network learning is more difficult than, than uh, decision tree learning. Yeah. Okay, yeah, summary. So this is now already the summary of this machine learning chapter. We are not finished with machine learning yet because neural networks are a part of machine learning too. But let's give a summary in terms of a classification of our machine learning algorithms. So now we, we can separate all the algorithms in machine learning in supervised learning and unsupervised learning and in reinforcement learning. So we have these three classes of algorithms. Uh, um, and in supervised learning we have seen lazy learning algorithm and easy, uh, sorry, eager learning algorithms. Lazy learning, the, 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 the well-known representative is the nearest neighbor methods. Yeah? And uh, in eager learning, decision trees, Bayesian networks, neural networks, these are eager learning algorithms. Now, let me ask you a question. What is the advantage of eager learning and what of lazy learning? So if you don't know the answer, maybe you, you should think of uh, a student learning. What is the advantage of lazy learning? Oh, that, uh, that's easy. Uh, learning doesn't take you much time because you're lazy. Yeah? So learning is very fast for the lazy learning algorithms, but you're going to have a hard time in the examination if you're lazy during learning. So maybe the examination takes much time because maybe you have to repeat it three times or even more often. Uh, and that's what happens in machine learning too. So no time for learning, just storing the data, but um, in order to classify new points, you have to compare the new point with all the old points. And in eager learning, learning may, may cause a lot of effort, but once you have done this, classifying or approximating new points can be very fast. So this is the eager learning is kind of a compilation process. Yeah? You compile a huge amount of data 
into a very compact representation. Yeah? So machine learning is closely related to data compression. Yeah? But we do not only compress the data such that the file is smaller, but also what's even more important is that um, classifying new data has to be fast. So we have to compile our data into algorithms, into algorithms which run, which are small and fast. Yeah, okay. Now uh, there is unsupervised learning and this was the clustering chapter. Huh? That's what we just talked about. Now the, the, the the, the primary uh, difference between supervised and unsupervised learning is what? It's about, it's about uh, the training data. What is the difference in training data? Yes, in classification. Or if we do approximation, we know the output of our function. Yeah? I mean, quite often this is called the labels. Yeah? In supervised learning, we do have labeled data. Yeah? The data come with the label which is the output, the class or the approximation value. And in unsupervised learning, there is no label. Let's draw a one-dimensional picture. So what we want in machine learning, we, we, all, we have some black box with some input variables, x1 through xn. And these have to be mapped onto, let's say, one output value uh, f of x vector. Huh? And we are looking for this function f. This function f, which is inside the black box, huh, has to be determined by using our training data. Okay. And the training data, they look like x1 through xn, um, 1, 1, and then x1, 2, to xn, 2, and so on. Um, so such an input file looks like that. But what is missing in this input file for supervised learning? Yeah. So of course we need uh, to have an, uh, let's call it a y value, y1, y2, and so on. Yeah? We need these labels. This is the crucial point. So this column is very important. Yeah. So now in, in a one-dimensional setting, we have this x1, x2 through xn and we know these y1 so this may be this point and this point oh sorry we're given a set of points and um, in case of approximation we are looking for a smooth function that interpolates between the points. So you see, uh, supervised learning, at least in the approximation setting, is nothing but interpolation. It's nothing but interpolation. So it's 
somewhat between statistics and numerical mathematics. Given a set of data points, how can we smoothly connect these data points? Or a different view is, given, let's, let's look here, we have two, four, six data points. Six data points, six samples, so we have kind of six snapshots of our simple world. And after learning, we have such a smooth curve. And this means we know how to compute the output value for infinitely many uh, inputs. So we do a generalization from a finite sample to our infinite set of inputs. Huh? That's what machine learning does. That's what we do all the time when we are in school. The teacher uh, gives us maybe five or ten examples of how to uh, multiply two numbers and then hopefully we understand it and we are able to solve infinitely many multiplication tasks. Okay, yeah. Now let's go to the unsupervised learning. Unsupervised learning is, in this picture here, if we only have these, these one-dimensional data points. And no, no, no labels. Huh? No, let's draw, let's draw a different picture. Because now, in clustering, we talk about classification. So now we have to draw the classification picture. And now our, our y, our output for the classification is discrete. In, let's take a three class example. Then the output is either one or two or three. Huh? And now we get some, some input points. Let's make them yellow again. And during learning, we do have the class label, which means maybe we get a 1 and a 3 and a 1 and uh, 2, 2, 3, 1, 1, 1, 2. Yeah? These may, are, may be our training data. And now the task of our learning algorithm is to, um, to find a function that maps all these guys onto uh, class 1 and these guys on 2 and the other on 3. This is supervised learning. In supervised learning, I know to which class the data points belong. In clustering, I have no idea. I have no idea to which uh, class our data points belong. And you see, uh, in this example, clustering would give me uh, something completely different from supervised learning. Clustering would put these probably into one cluster and maybe these and uh, maybe these. But this doesn't necessarily mean that they correspond to the same semantic classes. Yeah, that's the difference between unsupervised learning and supervised learning. So what, uh, uh, clustering is good for finding uh, kind of syntactical structure in the data. 
The semantics, semantics comes from our classes. But as, soon, as long as I don't know these classes, I just do have these input variables. An example where we do uh, clustering in, in our robotics project is in um, yeah, Mr. Chubek. He works on high-level machine learning, which is the robot has to learn complex sequences uh, of tasks. And this is also called planning. Yeah? Uh, for example, the robot has to, the service robot has to set up a table for a dinner. Yeah? And we know, okay, there are eight people coming for the dinner and the robot has to set up the table and then it will make a plan. First we get the plates, eight plates, and put one after the other around the table and it makes a plan how it will drive around the table and set the plates and then next comes uh, the soup plates on top of the, uh, the dinner plate and then come the knives and so on. Huh? Um, and now he uses machine learning for the robot to learn such a task. And during this machine learning process um, the robot has to extract, for example, what's the goal. In machine learning, a human person sets the table and the robot just watches it. The robot just watches it. And maybe the robot watches once and then again and again and then it has to generalize how to find a plan. So in the first step the robot learns what's the goal. So after setting up the table it looks like uh, evenly distributed around the, the table are the plates. And so then it may find finally, oh, it's very important to evenly distribute the plates around the table. Um, and then um, if the robot looks at image number one, which is table number one set up, and then the next learning episode, again a table was set up, and number three, and number four, maybe it looks at 20 tables. And what is common on these tables? Maybe they are kind of similar. And now we are in clustering again. So he tries to cluster these images. Uh, maybe there is one cluster of tables which are nicely set up um, and there is another cluster of table, tables how it looks like maybe after dinner and it's not uh, no more so, so nice. So it's a different cluster of images. So image clustering is quite important in robot learning. Uh. Okay, yes, and there is also reinforcement learning which is a third class of uh, machine learning algorithms and this is uh, the most advanced uh, type of learning um, and it's, uh, yeah, it's uh, an ongoing research field where we are still in, in the middle of basic research. I mean these, these other two types of algorithms there are so many industrial algorithms, commercial algorithms now, uh, applications, sorry, commercial applications now um, in supervised learning, uh, commercial applications and also clustering. Um, data mining is the best example. This is really commercial now. But in reinforcement learning, there, there do not exist commercial applications. There was on the reinforcement learning mailing list about two years ago an inquiry from somebody asking the community please tell him them about commercial applications. I mean there were, there were some postings about applications but no commercial applications because the computational complexity is so so high and I mean what is the task there in reinforcement learning? Um, it's even worse. It's even worse 
So we, we don't even have such uh, structured data. The, the task in reinforcement learning is again to learn such a function um, but this function is we call it a policy. If we, if we look at robots, a robot is in a certain state and then the question is what action should the robot do in some state in order to, for example, in order to learn walking. If I'm in this state, I would move my leg forward. And if I'm in this state, I would move the left leg forward and so on. Huh? Um, and what the robot does, it, it just tries to do some actions. I do an action maybe when I'm in this state and I move to the right, I would fall, fall down and then I get negative feedback and based on this negative feedback I might learn this was not so good. Um, and this is a very difficult area um, because quite often I don't get reinforcement. When I learn skiing, for example, um, I may do 500 elementary actions, which takes me 10 seconds, and it all feels good, but finally I fall down and may even get hurt. Um, so the feedback only comes at the end after 1,000 uh, steps. And now the question is, and that's the so-called credit assignment, this negative credit at the end, how could I assign it to which one of these 1,000 actions? Or another example, uh, chess playing. Uh, uh, learning to play games is reinforcement learning. Why? I, I play a whole chess game with 100 half moves and at the end I lose the game. Now the question, which one of these of my 50 half moves were good ones and which ones were bad ones. You have no chance to learn it from one single game. Maybe if you repeat it quite often and then you look at statistical similarities of these games and maybe you find out whenever I, uh, I, I used the Spanish opening it was not so good as if I used whatever against this opponent. Um, but this, this is, it's quite hard, um, but even more interesting because there is so much uh, research to do. There exist many algorithms nowadays and we will talk about this uh, towards the end of the semester. And that's it for today, thank you.